lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Okay, let's understand the difference, first of all, between legalism and sanctification. Sanctification does not come through keeping extra biblical rules. It's difficult enough keeping the biblical rules. I'm not speaking of the Old Testament legalism. I'm speaking of the do's and don'ts in the New Testament, some of which reiterate what's in the Old. Certain denominations have a holiness ethos where holiness that is being set apart unto God is confused with, with legalism. Christians don't go to movies. Christians don't go to the circus. Christians don't ice skate or whatever. Walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The only do's and don'ts that we can put on other people are the ones that are specifically stated in Scripture. Outside of that, it is a matter for the Holy Spirit to lead believers as to what to do or what not to do. On top of that, it may be very, very subjective. What could be wrong for one person might not be for another. For instance, I just got back from Italy yesterday. I was with some Italian Pentecostal believers for the last several days in southern Italy. These are people who are very conservative in their theology and also in their lifestyle. The women wear head coverings. They, they, they take seriously certain prohibitions about things like makeup and, and cosmetics and things like that. They're not really strict legalistic holiness Pentecostals, but they have that kind of a leaning. Um, almost the kind of a uniform when they come to church with the veils and so forth. These are very conservative Pentecostals uh, with very, very strong values concerning things like marriage and family and, and church. Yet every one of them, every one of them drinks wine every day with, with their, at least with their main meal. Virtually every day they have wine available and Italian Pentecostal pastors make wine. They actually make their own wine. Now, that would be absolute sin in other places. To these people, wine, small quantities of it, taken with the meal, is cultural, and it is purely a matter of, the, of their cuisine, of their country, and, the, and that's all. They don't get drunk. It's always with food, but it's there. Now, I know other people, other Pentecostals and, and Baptists in America would look upon this as sin. It's not sin. When people try to impose a church culture on other people and call that holiness. It is ridiculous. Now understand that Pentecostalism and Methodism thrived among the working classes and the urban poor, as did the Church of the Nazarene. In those communities, alcoholism was a big, big problem. Now, if you want to say that believers coming from those backgrounds should not drink alcohol because it could put a stumbling block before other people who were saved out of an alcohol abusive background or a stumbling block to preaching the gospel to the unsaved within their communities, that would be scriptural. That would be perfectly scriptural. All things are lawful, not all things are helpful. It may seem funny to some people, but I'm an evangelist of Jews. I have no problem with lobster or shrimp or bacon, but I don't eat those things. Not because it's a sin, not because it's wrong. It's just not helpful to my testimony to Jewish people to do it. But if I was to put it on somebody else, the way the Seventh-day Adventists might, or certain hyper-charismatic legalists uh, who are caught up in the extreme access of the Messianic movement might, that would be wrong. It's not a path to sanctification. Now, maybe the Lord's leading in my own life. It may be something in my own ministry that is 
more helpful to do or not to do so a particular uh, uh, observance. But to try to make it a standard and give it any kind of a doctrinal credence is wrong. When people do that, it comes from religious pride and or ignorance. Colossians and Galatians deal a lot with this. We're told in Colossians, why do you submit to decrees such as do not touch, do not eat? Do? I can just imagine a, a, a pulpit ignoramus from South Carolina going to Italy and standing up and, and, and speaking to an interpreter. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You're drinking that water from the devil's well. Hallelujah. That's the sin. You're living in sin drinking that wine. You're defiling the Lord. There are people who are so ignorant that they would say those things. Well, in Italy, it's not that kind of a cultural environment. If you're working in a rescue mission in, in the Salvation Army or something like this, and, and you're trying to reach people who are derelict and homeless and where alcohol abuse is prevalent, it makes sense why you wouldn't do it. I understand that. I respect that. But to put it on other people, don't confuse holiness with legalism. On the contrary, we're told these rule-keeping types of emphases will incite the old nature to want to do the things, particularly with people who are not regenerate. It will incite it. Walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. There are certain things I am not free to do, certain things I am free to do. Uh, I went through a two and a half to three year period as a young believer where I would not listen to any secular music, particularly not rock music and soul music or and rhythm and blues or classical, because I used to listen to Tchaikovsky and to, and to Dvorak, and I used to uh, listen to, to, to the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix and things like this and, 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 and so forth, and, and to Motown music from Detroit. I used to listen to that when I was high on drugs. I associated that kind of music with drugs. I went through illegal drugs. I went through a period for, for a couple of years, I wouldn't listen to Mozart. I wouldn't listen to the Kinks. I wouldn't listen to any of that stuff. Nothing. I wouldn't, you know, I would not listen to the Supremes. I would not listen to any secular music. I went through an incubator. Now, after a time, I grew in my faith. If I hear secular music now, I don't care if it's rock, I don't care if it's classical, I don't care if it's jazz, I don't care what it is. It's not going to affect me. I grew in my faith up to a point where it doesn't particularly affect me. I'll give you another example. Promiscuity, promiscuity by females is used by the devil and the world to incite males to lust. Promiscuity. But what the promiscuity is is defined by culture. Moriel operates in areas of Africa. I'm not joking. You go into tribal African areas of KwaZulu-Natal or other places like this in East Africa and so forth, where people are virtually naked. Virtually naked. What are you going to let them go to hell without the gospel? It's just they've been living that way for hundreds, thousands of years. It, it's not anything to them like it is in the West. Now, seductive dress would be. Seductive dress would be. Different issue entirely in tribal cultures. And you have a neo-tribalism in Europe, I'm telling you. You go to, to uh, I go to hydrotherapy clinics for, for my neck injury and so forth because it reduces my reliance on having to take drugs. I've got to take so many medications because of my lymphoedema. I try to reduce the amount of medication I take for other things. <clears throat> and hydrotherapy helps. But in Europe, the, all those things are, <laughs> are clothing optional. For me personally, for me personally, I see a girl with a seductive swimming suit, and I know she's wearing it to generate lust for somebody other than her husband, which, which would, not, would not be lust. I've got a problem. I go down to Africa, I go to the spa, whatever. I don't care if they're naked. You don't even think about sex. 
but somebody comes along and says, well, God didn't put it in his word exactly, so therefore we're just going to, you know, fill it in. <laughs> Holiness is not legalism. Walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And a modestly dressed young lady in the United States or in Britain or Australia is more likely to generate lust with somebody like me, and I only speak for myself, than somebody running around in some tribal environment naked. It just wouldn't matter to me. It just doesn't matter. It's like it, clinical clinical nudity, medical nudity. It's like having a baby or whatever, testicular cancer, or whatever. It just doesn't mean anything. Now, let's go to this issue of the blood. The life is in the blood, Scripture tells us. In Acts 15, it was one of the commandments of the Old Testament that was reiterated, the ritual consumption of blood. The Jehovah's Witnesses take this completely out of context and see it as a divine prohibition on blood transfusion, which it is not. And even then, where is it tissue fluid? Where is it just plasma? Or where does it have erythrocytes and leukocytes in the blood? What defines the blood? They're not specific about that either. They don't know. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses don't know. Medical science knows, but they don't know. Jehovah's Witnesses are largely uneducated people. Nonetheless, they distorted out of the context. What was this issue of the blood? If you were to look at the book of Revelation, chapter 17, verse 6, the harlot, the great harlot, is drunk with the blood of the saints. It has to do with the demonic practice of cannibalism, of vampire religion. You're consuming some other kind of blood than the blood of Christ. What's the blood of Christ? That which saves, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Well, what does that mean? In the context of John 6, it means to believe in the power of his blood to bring salvation. We have teachings on this from John 6. We explain the meaning of eating and drinking in the context of the epistle. But you have demonic and pagan practices involving ritual consumption of blood that always point ahead in some way to the great harlot, <clears throat> the false religious system of the world in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, who's drunk with the blood of the saints. She's inebriated by it. Christians should not consume blood in any ritual sense of the word. If the Roman Catholic teaching of transubstantiation, formulated in its present and final form by Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages, that's how it became explained, not until the Middle Ages was it explained, and it was explained on a debunked view of physics and chemistry that came from Aristotle. If, as Thomas Aquinas teaches, the communion wine is actually the protoplasmic blood of Jesus Christ under the appearances of wine. Why are they drinking it? They shouldn't be drinking it. The Holy Spirit told the apostles not to drink blood. Now, of course, it is not transubstantiated, but that's what they believe, or they're expected to believe. There are things in England, such as black pudding. I don't think Christians should eat it. I don't think Christians should eat it. Also in Kenya and East Africa, they feed babies a mixture of milk and, and cow blood. I don't think that that practice should be undertaken by people in, in the Maasai tribe and other tribes, particularly the Maasai <clears throat> in Kenya and Tanzania, who become Christians. I don't think they should do it. They should abandon it. However, <clears throat> it's primarily talking about the ritual consumption in Acts 15. It's not a prohibition or a, a divine legislation against transfusions. And it doesn't mean you have to be sure there's no redness left in the meat. The ritual slaughter of animals by a rabbinically certified butcher called the Shechter in ritual slaughtering, it had to do with the humanitarian killing of animals, which related to another of the prohibitions of the four prohibitions in Acts 15, specifically non-strangulation no cruelty to animals, which had additional pagan ramifications and implications. You had to ritually slaughter it in a way that would be painless, that would cut off the flow of blood, uh, blood supply to the brain in these animals, and they would die quickly and, and, and painlessly. 
but you'd let the meat hang. You'd let the blood go out so you would not consume it because the consumption of blood was a pagan demonic practice associated with idolatry. And ultimately, it had to do with the false religious system being drunk on the blood of the saints. But if you're going to become meticulous about it and go to these great lengths, you're focusing on the letter of the law, not the spirit. I used to earn my living in Israel for years filling prescriptions. And I worked in a pharmacy in an ultra-Orthodox Jewish neighborhood in, in Galilee. In, in the city of Haifa. And probably 85% of the clientele were Orthodox Jews. Uh, they spoke Yiddish as their main language, even though they spoke to me usually in Hebrew. Uh, but they've got this whole thing about the Hor Lotahor, ritual purity and ritual impurity. They would not sexually copulate during any kind of a menstrual flow, and that, okay, many people would be like that, even non-religious people in, in all cultures and all, all countries, but some of them became so fanatical. They wanted to buy test kits to make sure there was not the slightest trace of blood <laughs> left in the vaginal mucosa before they would continue sleeping with their husbands. It was absolutely absurd. Now, there was a lot of absurd things about this particular religious distortion of the Old Testament. They weren't to practice birth control because you need to have as many babies as possible. It's a mitzvah in case one of them is the Messiah. I'm not joking. They've got all of these man-made rules that are highly and a highly legalistic system designed to produce some kind of holiness. But it doesn't work. Those people are as corrupt as the day is long. They're as corrupt as anyone else. Even secular Israelis look upon most of them as being hypocrites. They reject their own Messiah. They keep all the rules, but they reject their own Messiah. It is no different when Christians emphasize holiness instead of the Holy Spirit. You achieve holiness, walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. When you begin looking, to add additional requirements or commandments or interpretations to the teaching of Scripture. <clears throat> You're going into the letter of the law, not the Spirit. On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus interpreted the letter in light of the Spirit. It was the Pharisees and Sanhedrin who emphasized the letter. We did a teaching tape, and I believe it is available online freely to the public, called Christ the Foundation. Christ the Foundation. On that, we deal with a number of subjects. You will not achieve holiness by putting the focus on do and do not rule keeping. You will achieve holiness by walking in the Spirit. Now, if the Word of God says something is wrong, plainly and clearly, it's wrong. That's obvious. But when people begin interpreting it and adding additional rules and, and so forth, this is crazy. We are not to get drunk. We're not to be inebriated. Paul says that those who are leaders in the church should not be given to wine. There are also warnings in the Old Testament about strong drink. Now, they didn't have distillation or spirits or whiskey or things like that. It was probably talking about hyper-fermented wine, something akin to brandy. Uh, Again, these things are not always clear linguistically or theologically. But we do know the principle is you use alcohol as a beverage or as a medicine. You do not use it as a drug <clears throat> for intoxication, for recreational intoxication. That's the teaching. That is the spirit of the law. Those believers I was just with in Italy are quite holy in their lifestyle. They're very moral people, very moral people. But they drink the one. They drink the one. Again, it is so easy to succumb to the tradition of the elders, to confuse the not, uh, denominational tradition, <clears throat> to confuse the commandments of men with the word of God. You have to be very careful exegetically. One of the things you will find is that those who push this rule-keeping holiness line the most 
are generally people who are ignorant of the original languages. They don't really know Greek or Hebrew that well. They're always going by the King James Bible, which I'm not opposed to, but it's fact it's a 17th century translation of a translation. Nehemiah 8.8 8 tells us the priority is on the original meaning of the original languages. The more ignorant somebody is theologically, the more ignorant they are of the original languages, the more ignorant they are doctrinally, the more likely they are to confuse legalism with holiness. Now, this is a big subject, but I would rather just look at what God clearly states in his word in Colossians. Why do you submit to decrees such as do not taste, do not touch, do not handle? These things for sure, for sure, have the appearance of religion, but they are useless in overcoming the flesh. Walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. I've never slept with anybody but my wife since she's been my wife. That's not because I don't have internet and I don't get spammed to pornography. That's not because I don't look at billboards of, of, of using sex to sell you everything from pop records to, to toothpaste. <coughs> or because I walk down the street in Chicago or New York or Paris with blinders on. It's because I walk in the spirit. It's because I want to love Jesus and I want to love my wife in Jesus. What God has joined together, that's it. That's the only reason. That's the only reason. You can make all the rules you wanted. I'd be an adult, I'd be an adulterer, I'd be a fornicator. It's only because of Jesus I'd, I'd never slept with anybody but, but my wife. <coughs> Since she's been my wife. It's only because of him. It's only because of him I never had an affair. Rules are never gonna keep anybody from not breaking them. Jesus will. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you.